Jai Baba. Jai Baba. It's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm sure both my wife and myself feel absolutely at home. Um, you would like to know how I came to Baba. Before we get on to other subjects, I think um, I'd rather introduce how I came to Baba. Well, I heard of Baba in 1948, but didn't get to see him until 1952. Uh, I must tell you about uh, one saint that I met before I met Baba. I had met a lot of saints, but this one particular chap, uh, he was important because one day when I went to see him, I didn't know who he was, but a friend of mine took me to him. This was in Bombay, and um, I entered the hall, and he was sitting at one corner of the room, and uh, as soon as he looked at me, quite a distance, he said, you go away. Yeah, I didn't know what was happening. And um, then he said, that there is somebody much higher than me who will take care of you later on. <laughs> So well, I said, okay. I didn't know. Who that was. <laughs> I didn't know who that higher person was. But anyway, 17th of April, 1952. This was the day that I saw Baba for the first time. Now I'll tell you that I heard about him in 1948, and a friend of mine told me that Baba was coming to Bombay on the 17th. This was just one day prior to his uh, departure to the West. Remember, Baba left on his 1952 trip on 18th April. So, a friend of mine told me that uh, Baba is coming to Bombay and uh, why didn't I go and see him? Because I was in the habit of seeing saints. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I talked to a friend of mine and she said, well, if you're going, I would like to also join you. So both of us, though I didn't really want to go that day, because um, I was appearing for my university examination in medicine and just eight days hence was the exam and I didn't want to waste my time. So even then, both of us uh, went to see Baba and Baba was staying at Nariman's house, if you all know that, where that house is. The time for the darshan was from 9 to 8, 11 in the morning and uh, both of us, we searched and searched and searched and we couldn't find the house. Ultimately, when we did get to the house, it was 11.15 and I remember it was Baidul who was standing there at the gate uh, I didn't know him then, but I now know that it was Baidul, and Baidul said, I'm very sorry, the time is up, you cannot get Darshan. I was quite annoyed about it, having wasted two hours of study time and not to get Baba's Darshan. So we started arguing with him and uh, he went inside and came back with the same reply, very sorry, the time is up. We were not going. So the lady with me suddenly thought that and she told him, tell Baba that we are devotees of Upasni Maharaj. You know Upasni Maharaj, that is Mir Baba's master. So, when this message was carried inside, <coughs> Baba immediately called us in. And uh, he was sitting in, in Nariman's room in one corner, and uh, both of us entered at the other end. And uh, you see, we had seen a lot of saints before we met Baba. And uh, normally when you go to a saint in India, you carry some flowers, you take a garland or some fruits or some sweets uh, and bow down to him. Here we were going to see a Parsi saint, so we didn't know how to greet him. So we never took any flowers, we never took anything with us. And uh, when we went into the room, we just didn't know what we were going to do there. And suddenly Baba does this, which means the interpreter told us, Baba says, don't put your head on his feet. Okay, we, we were more lost than before. So, <laughs> then he said this, so we sat down very near to him. Then he did this, and the interpreter said, Baba says both of you are very good souls and he's happy to see you all. Then he did this, so the interpreter went, interpreter was Irich, I presume, and he went inside and uh, brought two pieces of candy, and um, Baba gave one to that lady, and she caught all of Baba's hand and touched it to her forehead, and then he gave it to me, and I did the same, and then do you know what Baba said? Go! Get out! <laughs> <laughs> so within two minutes, we were out of the room. We ate the candy and forgot all about Baba. <laughs> really, this first contact with Baba had no impact upon me at all. But it grew over the years. And 
I met the Baba again in 1954 and then 55. In 55, became very intimate with Baba because that was the time when we had a Sarvas program. You know what a Sarvas program is like? You had at Myrtle Beach intimate companionship with Baba, and uh, that was the time really that we got very intimate with Baba. And uh, Baba just poured his love on you at that time, and uh, we had been divided into several groups because India, as you know has as many languages as there are states. <coughs> so we were in the Gujarati group, that is all the Parsi boys. And the Parsi boys, as you know, they're all full of fun and mischief. If the ten Parsi <laughs> boys come to Washington, I think they'll play hell into you. <laughs> <laughs> so these Parsi boys, we were two hundred of them. Two hundred Parsi boys with Baba there, also a Parsi. So we really enjoyed the company <laughs> and the fun we had. And the greatness of Baba was, that he came down to your level. He came down to our level and he played with us and he ate with us and we just had lots and lots of fun. I can tell you a few incidents that time. Uh, each afternoon we'd have a heavy meal. All Parsis have heavy meals, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, here we really enjoyed the food there because um, it was really good. And. Um, each afternoon after the meal, we'd uh, sort of relax a little and laze away for some time because Baba would come again at 1.30 in the afternoon. And each afternoon when Baba would come back, we'd just sort of, you know, wash our faces and, uh, and come back to the cabin room, or not the cabin room, the big hall at Meribad. You know the Meribad hall. So we'd all click there and then Baba would ask us, is everybody here? <coughs> so everybody look around and say, yes, Baba. Then one day, one of the boys said, no, Baba, one of my friends is not here. Baba said, where is he? He's sleeping, Baba. Come on, let's go and wake him up, Baba said. And there, Baba got up from the chair and 200 of us followed him <laughs> and all went to the tent and Baba said, don't make a noise, don't wake him up. I'm going to wake him up. So Baba got into the tent and this fellow snoring away. And so Baba picked up a small, thin stick from the ground and tickled him in his nose. <laughs> and this fellow in his dream, he doesn't <laughs> and, and Baba said, don't make noise, don't wake him up. And then again Baba tickled him and this fellow again. <laughs> and the third time Baba gave him a big dig and he got up in a fright. <laughs> see Baba in front of him, do a little bit. He never overslept. <laughs> that is one of the things. Then, each day we'd play games with Baba. Sometimes we'd play seven tiles. You know that seven tiles? You know that game? Well, it's, uh, you know, tiles from the roof fall down and break. So then the pieces are put one on top of another and seven tiles, you know, piled one on top of another and there are two parties. And then one party throws the tennis ball and tries to break that pile while the other party tries to hop it. So Baba, you know, pick up his sadra, his long sadra, you know, got a picture here. He'd put it under his pants like that and roll up his sleeves and there he'd be ready with the ball, you know. And he was so quick and fast with the ball, you know, nobody could catch that ball over there in the opposite party. And then if you strike the seven tiles, you have to run away because that opposite party had to strike you with the ball then. If, you, if they could strike you, then your party was out. And if we could come before they strike us and pile the tiles one on top of another, then we had got one point. So here each afternoon Baba would play with us these seven times and it was really fun playing with him. <coughs> and uh, each afternoon, you know, after a good meal, everybody wants to sleep. And there Baba would be talking to us on some high subjects at times, you know, on love and, and uh, obedience and things like that. You know, Listen to Humanity, if those who read the Listen to Humanity, the book, the first part of it is a perfect description of this five days of in 1955. So, some days he'd talk to us uh, on this subject or that subject and some of us would doze, you know. And Baba would say, keep awake, keep awake. And then we just couldn't keep awake. So then Baba would say, come on, tell us some funny stories. And then one of the boys would get up and tell some funny story and Baba would be laughing and everybody would be laughing and everybody would be wide awake. <laughs> I don't want to tell you the funny story. <laughs> <laughs> then. All days was not fun. All days was not fun. Sometimes Baba was serious also, giving some important things, talks and laughs and things. And one day I remember uh, when we were having lunch, Baba himself came round to serve us the food. 
<coughs> and uh, I don't know if you know what a spoon is. Well, there are some round things made of wheat, and Baba came around with a big basket of them, serving foodies to us. When he came to us, to me and a friend of mine, he says, you don't know how fortunate, this is a sign of being fortunate, you don't know how fortunate you all are that I am serving you these foodies. We really didn't know the importance of these words then. Most of us, I think, when we say Avtar Mer Baba Ki Jai or we call Baba as Avtar or the Christ, we, I tell you, we don't even know a thing of what we are saying. To imagine even the spiritual status of Baba is beyond our conception, it's beyond our imagination. The spiritual status of Baba is something so great. But because he came down to our level and played with us, we forgot that spiritual status. And even if we had to have an intellectual understanding of that status, we could never have known Baba as he, as he really was. It was very, very difficult. One day I remember when two of us were sitting there near Baba, and Baba said, uh, he was talking about alcohol. And uh, Baba said, uh, have you had alcohol? So my friend said, no. So Baba said, when you have alcohol, he, and then he described all the things that happen to a person when he has alcohol. So Baba says, I might describe this to you or you might read books on this subject and you might have a complete intellectual understanding of what that means. But until you taste the alcohol, you'll never know what intoxication means. So similarly, we can never know who Baba was until we come, become one with him. And that I think is impossible, just impossible. So Baba, when he told us, you have no idea how fortunate you all are when I am giving you this food to eat. He said, I remember these words and I just can picture Baba giving us that food. And he was saying, there are so many in the Himalayas, so many yogis sitting there since hundreds of years, shedding tears of blood to even have a glimpse of me. And they don't get that. And yet you all are so lucky to be with me, to play with me, and here I am giving you food, eat. Those words have a meaning now. They didn't carry much meaning at that time. Really, how great Baba was. And, oh, let's not talk. Well, you, know, you break down. In this Hawass uh, uh, came along a boy uh, who was not much attracted by Baba, but somebody told him that why not come along. So he did come there, but he was not too happy about being there. And uh, he was just sort of a spectator to everything that was happening. And uh, this was not in our group, mind you, in another group. He was a Hindu boy. And uh, one day he uh, was sitting for, you know, he got into a line for a shaving. You know, in India, <coughs> during the Savas program, there's always one Baba over there. And he comes there with his big cut throat, ready to shave everybody who comes and sits in front of him. It's an open air shave, you know. And uh, so this fellow got into the queue, and um, he was rather skeptical about, about Baba and all the things that were happening there. And uh, just when it, it, and the man in front of him finished shaving, and it was his turn, uh, suddenly one Baba lover comes <coughs> running and uh, tells the Baba, shave me first. So this fellow, a very intelligent man, uh, MA, PhD and so many credentials to him. So this fellow thought that this man, how can he get inside when we are waiting in the queue for a shave and this fellow comes and says, shave me first and he, he plumps himself over there in front of this fellow and uh, already he was skeptical about Baba and he felt that is there injustice in, in, in Mehrabad also, where Baba, who calls himself God, is, is he really God? If, there, if he is God, then this fellow must not be shaved for, before me, he thought. <laughs> so, but this fellow wouldn't insist it. And he sat down there and the Baba applied the soap on him. And uh, it's the same reason for everybody, mind you. <laughs> so, uh, this fellow was being shaved and he got half shaved and suddenly, uh, while this man is thinking in his heart that this man must get up from here if Baba is really, really what he calls himself to be. Suddenly there was a call for that man 
that Baba is calling you. So he, he, he tells the man who is calling him, wait, wait, I'm, I'll finish my shave and come. So that man went and told Baba that Baba is having a shave and uh, he'll come out just a minute or two later. Baba says, call him now. So this fellow had to go to Baba with half soap one side and half side shaved, you know. But why I'm telling you this is that Baba was trying to tell this fellow, this skeptical chap, that he knows what's going on in everyone's hearts and minds. And so this fellow had to go to Baba. Well, lots of things we did during those sawas. And I remember we had once a Kowali program. You know what's a Kowali program? These are spiritual songs sung by fellows who can sing them. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> I can. And nor can I understand them. But, uh, at times, uh, you know, when they, they have to get into the temple, and it takes a long time before they get into the temple. And before they uh, come to sing, you know, they sort of adjust the instruments, which itself takes an hour or so. And they wet their whistles with lots of cups of tea and things like that before they come in, and then with, you know, a wonky uh, caps on their heads and come and sit down and make all poses in front of Baba and Baba sings. Yeah. Because Baba used to enjoy these kawalis. So, you know, what happens during these spiritual kawalis, these spiritual songs, sometimes, People were faint. And uh, Baba would never like a disturbance during this Kawai program. And uh, so, before the Kawais begin to sing, Baba would uh, keep two or three volunteers ready so that in case somebody did faint, you know, it's the ecstasy, the joy of that singing uh, that uh, makes you uh, 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 go unconscious. So, before this, Baba keeps two or three people ready. And I remember when uh, we were there, one of the Parsi boys, big, hefty fellow, maybe one and a half times my size, and uh, he was kept as one of the volunteers to pick up anybody bodily and take him out so that there would be no disturbance and the program wouldn't be disturbed. So, the Kowali program started. And Baba was really enjoying it and that man was singing very well. Halfway through, everybody was his eyes glued on Baba and that singing and that atmosphere was so good. All of a sudden they hear a big noise, doom, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? You know, this big hefty fellow, this volunteer, he fainted. <laughs> uh, who's there to pick him up? <laughs> and the whole program was spoiled, you know, because this fellow came. <laughs> This is just something about the Sarvaj program. We had one 55 Sarvaj program. Then in 56, Baba came to my town. That's no sorry. And uh, I've written a detailed account on that in, of that visit in the Awakener. If you have one of the recent issues, it's called the Archives of No Sorry. The four visits that Baba paid to No Sorry. We we'll read that up somewhere there. Then in 58 again we had a Sarvaj, and then Baba started coming to uh, Guru Prashad. You know, Guru Prashad is the bungalow at Pune. And each year he'd come there end of March, stay through April, May and go back in June. Lots of things happened in Bhutasa, I must say. Lots and lots of things. But I'll tell you some stories which I think the other monthly may not tell you because they feel shy to tell you about these things. Some of the things that they used to do in the old times at Mirabad. These are not printed things, and therefore I said, don't print these things because they shouldn't be in the book. Uh, I remember, this is from the Manli only, that um, Baba, when he was staying at Mehrabad, Mehrabad wasn't existing at that time, that um, the food given to the Manli was so meager and so poor that these poor party fellows, you know, they just couldn't stand that food. And every day the same monotonous food for breakfast, lunch and dinner, the same thing. And um, usually it will be tea and chapati or chapati and tea. <laughs> and um, without milk. And you can imagine how these Parsi fellows who, as I said, Parsi boys know how to eat. And all the visitors who came to see Baba, they bring a lot of food and sweets and all that. And all that food, Baba distributed to the Prem Ashram boys. So there, there would be so much food, and yet they didn't get a, even a peep out of that. So, one day, 
Each night, Baba would get all the remains of the sweet tied up into a sort of a, a packet. And then, uh, you know, because there are rats and cats and with two legs and four legs also, so he'd get it tied up to the ceiling of one of the rooms, you know, so that nobody could reach it. And somebody who had a, to climb up on a ladder to tie it right up, you know, so that nobody should reach it in the next time. And the next morning, again, these streets would be distributed to the boys. So one of the Mandalay thought, let's get to the streets today. <laughs> So, three of them, I won't name them, there. <laughs> one of them passed away recently. <laughs> so, three of them got together and planned how they could, um, you know, do the things in the night time. Because Baba would retire to his room and um, the three of them thought that it was impossible to take a ladder there because it would make noises and it would disturb somebody and Baba would come there or something like that. So the three of them, they collected there and quietly opened that room in the night stand and one fellow bent down while the other fellow climbed on his back and the third <laughs> fellow was holding his hand and this fellow is just trying to open that thing. All of a sudden, who should come inside? Baba. Baba <laughs> <laughs> uh, said, what's happening here? <laughs> Baba arrived just at the time when he shouldn't have. <laughs> I, I tell you one personal thing that happened to me also, something very funny like this. Uh, we were at Guru Prasad and uh, uh, you know the big hall of Guru Prasad was full, jam-packed. And uh, all of us were looking at Baba and there was some musical program going on. And when we were with Baba, at least myself, I talked myself, I don't know about the others. You know, I had my eyes glued on Baba all the time because the maximum that we could, I mean, we just didn't want to move our eyes away from Baba. And people would come to see Baba, embrace him, somebody would cry, somebody would shed tears, somebody would do this, somebody would do that, and go away. But we never bothered, at least I never bothered to see who was coming in. Now, one such day when the music was going on, and people were coming one after another to Baba, and I was standing in one corner, as my usual corner, and uh, looking at Baba, all of a sudden, what should happen? A beautiful girl comes in the queue. And just when she comes to Baba, I looked at her. And just at that time, Baba looks at me and says, What are you thinking of? <laughs> <laughs> he knew our thoughts, he knew our minds, he knew our hearts, he knew everything. We were just open in front of him, you know, we couldn't hide him. Especially when we had a uh, rather a sexy dream in the night and next morning, you sure? The Baba would ask you, what dream did you have last night? <laughs> <laughs> and in front of everybody you have to tell it, you know. <laughs> One of the Western ladies who was with Baba years back, she really loved Baba, but she, at the back of her mind she always loved the horse also. She wanted a horse, you know, in Mirabai. And uh, I hope that lady is not here, you know. <laughs> And um, she, Baba knew what was going on in her mind, you know, she really knew, liked horses. So one day, Baba asked the Mandali uh, to enclose a big area of the ground on the hill. And uh, with uh, bamboos and netting and all that was done. And nobody knew what all this was about. When the enclosure was made, all of a sudden, one day, one man comes along with a horse. Because Baba had sent for a horse. And uh, Baba calls this lady and says, well, here is a horse and you're in charge of it. You've got to groom it, you've got to feed it, you've got to do everything for this horse. And she was all joy because she really wanted a horse. So there she was busy the whole day with that horse, you know, busy riding it and feeding it and, and giving it food. And every morning Baba would come with pocketfuls of, uh, of carrots and Baba would feed it. And she felt really happy. A month later the horse fell ill. And uh, Baba said, I think the horse should be sent back. So the horse was sent away. But anyway, she wanted a horse and Baba gave it to her. But that doesn't mean that if you wanted a helicopter, he'd build a hangar for you there. No. At times, he was unpredictable. But he came down to your level and he knew everything that was going on in your heart. So then, he could respond to every, every thought, every feeling he'd respond. 
and thousands of people there and just at the time when you're thinking of something, Baba look at you and, and give you an answer for it. You know, he didn't have to give an answer verbally, he didn't have to give it with his hands. He just looked at you and you knew that Baba was giving you a reply to it. Uh, in these old days at Mirabad, I remember once Baba shifted the whole ashram to Toka. You know this place called Toka. So, a few of the Mandali were left behind in the ashram and um, there was one Irani gentleman and Baba called them, you know what this sign means, cracked. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a wee bit cracked and um, he was given the duty of a night watchman. And at that time there was a big um, uh, decoit called uh, Satyamang. And this Satyamang uh, was a terror to everybody. And uh, one day they heard that he had robbed somebody on the road between Mehrabad and Ahmednagar. So everybody was frightened that he might come to the ashram also. And just that night, on the following night, what happened was that this Irani gentleman, a little cracked as he was, was on night duty, you know, with a stick. And every fifteen minutes he had to shout, all well, all well, so that people knew that he was awake and not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> so, suddenly he hears footsteps in the, in the compound and he really thought that Satyaman had come. So he got so frightened that all he could say was, Satyaman is here, Satyaman is here. And, uh, he couldn't move from there, he couldn't see wh whether it was Satyaman or somebody else, but he was just stuck to the ground there and Satyaman is here. <laughs> yeah. And the Mandali got up inside and uh, they heard this, Satyamang is here, oh God, he's come here, what, what is he going to do? One of the old Mandali fainted, you know. And then they came out with lanterns and big sticks and all, and when they did come out in the compound, it was a donkey. <laughs> in the 1958 service, I remember, one Baba lover from central India had come and no children were allowed for that service. But this boy, uh, this man, uh, he wanted, uh, he couldn't leave his children back at home. And, and um, you don't get uh, babysitters back home. So he had to bring them. And he asked for pardon from Baba. So Baba said, all right, it's all right that you brought them. But see that they don't come in the tent. That is where the meeting hall is. But leave them outside, somewhere outside, so that they don't disturb me. So he said, Baba, it's all well taken care of because I have brought a servant and uh, she'll take care of the children and see that they don't come to the tent. So I said, okay. One day, I remember, while the meeting was going on, Baba all of a sudden called this Mr. L and said, where are your children? So, he was giving discourse and all of a sudden he said, where are your children? So he said, well, Baba, they are with my servant. Baba said, no, they are not with your servant. Go and check. And he went there, and do you know what was happening? The big well, you know, just outside the ashram in Lower Mehrabad, there's a big well from where the water supply is coming right now. These children were playing on the wall of that well. And the servant had gone off to somewhere or the other, and something, I mean, one of them could have easily fallen inside the well. And Baal saved the whole situation there. This man, the same man I'm talking about, he had a son who was um, absolutely mad at him, I must say that. And uh, because uh, before that son was born, uh, the mother had a very high temperature and uh, so the doctor said that the son, something had affected him and he had gone completely mad. And uh, so, and he's a very poor man and with one son mad in the family means you can imagine how difficult it was for him. But he loved Baba so much that he accepted Baba's will. And one day he thought, let me take this son to Baba. He could, had no money also. He had to borrow money to take his children and his wife to Baba. I remember sometimes in India, poor people coming from long distances. And I know of one person who walked 700 miles just to come to see Baba once. In his lifetime, that was his only chance to see Baba, because he had no money. And those of you who've been to UP, that's Hamirpur district, 
Baba says, Hamirpur district is my heart. The people there are so much love for Baba. So, these people over there, all that they live on is farming. They have very small plots of land and their only possession <coughs> is two bullocks with which they plough the land. And they sell off the bullocks in order to come to see Baba. And when they go back, there is nothing to live on. And this fellow didn't have even bullocks, so he walked 700 miles just to see Baba once in his lifetime. Can you imagine how much they suffered all throughout the journey? And some of these Hamirpur fellows who used to come, I remember I was treating them, so Baba tell me, take great care of them, they are very poor people. And they'd come traveling two, two and a half days to three days from their town to Pune. It would take almost three days by train to come. And traveling class three in India, oh God, it's just terrible. And these fellows would come right from that Hamirpur district to Pune. They didn't have money to eat. So all they would bring is bread from there, you know, these chapatis, thick chapatis. From, right from Hamirpur they'd bring that sop it up in water and eat that. Or bring an onion from the market, you know an onion, you can get it anywhere, and cut it at, and with that chapati then eat that onion. I have seen this with my own eyes. And uh, oh, it's just terrible how poor they are. But they are rich in Baba's love, very rich in Baba's love. And they are still contented, that's the great thing. Then in spite of all those troubles, they just feel so happy to come at least once to see Baba. Uh, I don't know where I was talking about. So, ah, this mad fellow, this boy, uh, who was mad, uh, his father brought him to Guru Prasad and uh, he had three children, so he bought garlands for each of them. He bought five, one for himself and his wife, uh, two for his, and three for the children. and. Uh, all of them came to Guru Prasad and this was their first time they were coming to see Baba. They had heard so much, they had read so much about Baba, they had loved Baba so much, but this was their first chance to come and see Baba. And um, they just couldn't afford even a garland, but even then they spent five cents on the garland for each one, so that they could at least give that much, they didn't have anything else to give to Baba. So when they came to see Baba, uh, this mad boy was also in the queue and uh, when he came near Baba, he just threw the garland away and ran outside and sat somewhere outside on the veranda. And the father was practically in tears Then his son didn't meet Baba. So Baba asked him, what's wrong with the boy? So he said, well Baba, he's mad and he, he's a great nuisance to us. The little that we have in the house he breaks. He destroys everything, he wants to eat the whole day, and it's just impossible to live with this boy. Baba said, he's not mad, he's a must. M-U-S-T, no, M-A-S-T, he's a must, a God-intoxicated man. And then Baba said, this was a Friday, and uh, Baba said, remind me about him on Sunday. So he said, okay Baba. On Saturday again this whole family came to see Baba. When they were coming, this boy all on his own in the morning tells his father, I want a garland for Baba. And he takes a garland and that day without his father taking him to Baba, he goes straight to Baba, garlands him, embraces Baba and sits down there, just like any of us. And uh, then because Baba had said, remind me about him on Sunday, so the father reminded Baba about him on Sunday and Baba said, I've already taken care of him. That boy is still living, I've seen him, he's become absolutely sober and he it doesn't destroy and, and do all the things that he used to, but he just sits quietly at one spot and probably whatever, if he's a must, well, I don't know what he does, but he's, <laughs> but he's become sober, that much I know. Some funny incidents at Guru Prasad. Uh, I remember uh, people would come to see Baba from the morning about 9 to 11 o'clock. And uh, in the afternoon, only a few selected people would be called by Baba. And um, by Baba's 
love and grace I was always there each afternoon and uh, in the afternoon Baba would play with us cards you know that famous game of cards Larisk and Baba would always win because he always cheated <laughs> <laughs> he was perfect in everything and therefore he was perfect in the art of cheating also <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think you know how that game is played Baba would sit on a chair and all the rest would be in a semicircle and, uh, he, and the man next to him would be in the opposite party and the third man would be in his party so every alternate man was in Baba's party and then cards would be doled out to everyone and the first person to get the cards would be Baba two or three cards would be given and anybody who can if there were two cards doled out then uh, anybody who could make two tricks won the game and uh, so as soon as Baba got the two cards and he thought that he, they were good he'd keep them if they were not good he said you better shuffle again <laughs> and uh, so again he'd get the card and if he had one good card he'd look around here and there and pick up somebody's card and put this back there <laughs> so he'd always be winning you know? and, uh, and um, he'd peep into somebody else's cards and tell him have you got the ace and, <laughs> <laughs> and, the game. and before the man had dealt out all the cards Baba's, uh, Baba's, uh, Baba's party would have won <laughs> and, and, the, and the other party had to rub their noses on the ground because they lost <laughs> and Baba said, you are really fortunate to rub your noses in front of me. But remind me, I'm, I'm telling you that Baba cheated, but he wouldn't let any of us cheat. And once one of the, uh, the people playing there, he looked into the neighbor's cards, and Baba got very really annoyed about it. He said, why did you cheat? He said, Baba, I didn't cheat. I saw you cheating. Why did you cheat? I'm sorry. Baba forgive. You know, he always forgive. Uh, that is the game of cards and each afternoon we play this game of cards and uh, we were just a selected few and the fun we'd have with Baba that time the parties that we'd have were always in the afternoon so one day there was an ice cream party and um, it was a mango ice cream and uh, it was not the usual ice cream that you have in the west it was a churned ice cream you know the big mold and churn and mango ice cream you know Oh, I, I, I can think of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, we were playing cards and all of a sudden the, the big mold of ice cream arrived and Baba says, come on, come on, bring it in, bring it in, let's have ice cream and leave the cards, you know. He'd come down to your level and, and behave exactly as you would want him to behave. So, that ice cream mold was brought inside and um, Baba said, come on, you start opening it and distributing it to everybody. So, I got up and uh, you know there is a cylinder inside with all ice and salt water on the side and uh, Baba said bring the plates and Pendu rushed inside and brought the plate and the teaspoons and uh, Baba said come on open the thing I want to taste it so I tried to open the lid and the lid just refused to budge and I said, Baba said come on quick come on quick and that lid just wouldn't budge and ultimately when it did budge it came out with such a shock that the salt water got inside. And I said, now what to do? And nobody had seen what had happened. I was the only fellow who was seeing that thing. I said, now what to do? Come on, give it to me, come on, give it to me. So all the salt water on the top, you know, on the ice cream, and I doled it out to Baba and Baba. Excellent, it's really good. It's really good. And I <laughs> <laughs> so I was just wondering what to do. And then Baba says, come on, give it to everybody. So everybody had it. And nobody tasted the salt in it. And once it was Eric's birthday, I remember. And um, we were playing cards and all of a sudden his mother sent two huge packetfuls of something called bhajiyas, you know. We call it bhajiyas. Uh, in your terms it would be something like fritters. Is that right? So, and um, that's one of my weak points in food. <laughs> so, so, Baba said, oh, the bhajiyas have arrived, come on, let's have them. So, mind you, we had all had had a very good lunch. And soon after that, these bhajiyas arrived. Two full big packets. So, Baba said, bring a tray, and the tray was brought, and uh, Baba said, open it. So, since I used to sit next to Baba always, I had the, the thing to open it. And I emptied out one bag on that big tray and it filled the whole tray and Baba said, you hold it while I give it to all the, the money. So, you know, when Baba gave, he didn't give one at a time, he'd give it like that, you know. 
And uh, so one after another, Francis was the first fellow in the in the circle. So Francis took it, and naturally nobody could eat it because all had had a big lunch. And uh, so Francis took it in his hands and then walked out of the room, tied a packet and kept it outside for tea time, and came back and sat down. And then the next, and then the next, and then the next. And finally, when it was my turn, Baba picked up a big bunch of it and said, put the tray down and he gave it to me and he said, sit here and eat it. And I had already overeaten lunch and because I like those things, Baba said, eat it right now. And with difficulty, you know, one after another, with difficulty, I finished them. And then Baba picks up another bunch and says, eat it right now. <laughs> My taste for bhajiyas went away that day. <laughs> 1965, remember, the Pune Hall was open. And that time, Baba, 1st of May, Baba had gone there for the opening ceremony. And uh, Bhikkhu, you know Bhikkhu, the Milan, Milan studio man, he, or most pictures taken in India by, by this man, Bhikkhu. He's a great guy. And uh, he took so many pictures of Baba that day. And um, he enlarged them to a big size for that. And if you go to Pune, you'll see them all hanging on the walls are all Bhikkhu's pictures. <coughs> so these pictures were all, uh, 200 of them were brought to Baba. And um, Baba looked at them and Baba was very happy about it. So this Bhikkhu, he took a number of snaps uh, on the 1st of May enlarged them and brought them to Baba and uh, they were very costly and uh, so Baba told them at Guru Prasad that you must accept payment for them. So he said, no Baba, I'm not going to take it and um, this is just a gift from me to you. Baba says, you must take the money for it uh, and um, he said, no, you know, in love we disobeyed Baba a number of times. Baba always stressed on obedience more than love because none of us can love Baba as he should be loved. None of us means besides Mera. Mera is a class by herself. None of us can love Baba as he should be loved. And therefore Baba prayed more attention to obedience. And here Baba says, I am giving you the money for the pictures. And he says, no Baba, I am not going to accept them. In his love, he forgot that this was disobedience. And then Baba called uh, the Pune Center uh, trustees and they said that you must pay off Bhikkhu for these 200 pictures because it's quite a lot of expense. So they asked him for the money and uh, to take the money and he refused. So then Baba said, what are you going to do then? So Baba, he says, Baba, can you grant me one wish? So in exchange for the money, you know. So Baba says, what, what do you want? So he said, Baba, come to my studio once. So Baba said, okay. This is Baba's sign for okay. Can you hear me now? And uh, so Baba one day agreed to go to Niku's studio. And Bhikkhu was all just in seventh heavens, you know, because Baba was coming there. And uh, I remember uh, I had climbed into his, it's on the first floor. And I had climbed up under the first floor. And this fellow was ready with on his camera and Baba arrived. And, and every step that Baba took on, the, on, those, uh, on that staircase to come up, he must have flashed the camera a number of times. And then Baba came inside the, the, the studio and sat down and Baba said, you ask me to pose in whatever position you want me, I'll, I'll, I'll pose for you today. I'm happy with your love. So this fellow made Baba sit in this position and that position <laughs> and Baba posed and he did everything that Bhikkhu wanted that day. And he must have taken at least a hundred snaps that day. And uh, then Baba said, are you satisfied? So he said, yes, Baba. He embraced Bhikkhu and Baba left. And Bhikkhu got inside the dark room to develop all of them. And all of them black. <laughs> they didn't taught him a lesson, you know, not to disobey. But he, this Bhikkhu was really full of fun. And uh, I remember once, uh, Baba was in Mahableshwar. You know, that's a hill station uh, very near Pune. And Baba was there at Mahableshwar in strict seclusion. Uh, and uh, that time, Baba called Mherji, you know Mherji. So, Mirji, uh, when Mirji got the telegram or the message or something like that, that Baba wants you at Mahableshwar, Bhikkhu was there. <coughs> so, Mirji tells Bhikkhu, why didn't you come along with me? So, he says, the telegram says only for Mirji. So, he says, come along, it doesn't matter. 
So Bhikkhu and another friend of his, both of them said, come on, well, Mahirji is inviting us, we may as well go there. So they got in the Mahirji's car and they went there. And when they reached Mahabaleshwar, Baba said, why have you two fellows come? And these two fellows are full of mischief, you know, Bhikkhu and that other guy. And uh, so they said, they looked rather sheepish, you know, because they had, they had no orders to come. So Meiji said, Baba, I brought them. Ira said, Baba, Meiji has brought them. Leave them. It doesn't matter. So Baba said, okay, stay. So Baba forgave them for that. But these fellows are after mischief, you know. They sat near Baba for some time, and then Baba asked them to go out for tea and all. Oh. So these fellows thought of a plan, you know. Just outside where Baba was staying was a post office, a telegraph office. So they went there and sent a telegram to Pune to another Baba lover called Mr. Garekar, who is dead and gone now. And this Garekar old man, uh, they telegrammed him, Baba wants you immediately. And, and the signature was Eraj, underneath. So, so this telegram reached in the night, you know. In the night it reached Pune and they had sent it off in the evening. And the telegram reached there in the evening and this Garekar opened his eyes in the night and saw this telegram, Baba wants you immediately. He had no other way to go. He's a poor man. He took a taxi for 80 miles to go in a taxi, cost a fortune. And uh, next morning, Garekar arrives there with, a, with uh, this thing at the, at the place where Baba was staying. And Baba said, who called you? <laughs> so he says, here's the telegram. Come immediately. Eraj. <laughs> the telegram said Eraj. So Baba called Eraj. And he says, well, what are you up to, mischief? What's this? So he says, Baba, I know nothing about this. <laughs> it was then Bhikkhu. By the time Bhikkhu and, and the friend had left from there, you know. <laughs> so Baba knew and Mandli knew that this is all Bhikkhu's mischief. So once again when Baba was in Pune, and this was at the botanical garden. And uh, before Baba came to Guru Prasad, he used to give darshan in botanical garden. And uh, so Baba called about 25 Baba lovers from Pune. And Bhikkhu and this Mr. S were also there. And uh, all of them went up and embraced Baba. And Baba embraced all the 23, but these two fellows Baba didn't embrace. So Baba says, uh, so they, you know, they knew that they had done this mischief. So Baba just pulled out the telegram from his pocket and said, who said this telegram? They said, yes, Baba, we sent it. So Baba says, go and stand under that tree for some time. <laughs> so both of them were asked to stand under the tree and he, he, Bhikkhu's quite a bigly big man and the other fellows also big big man. And both of them standing there crying away, you know, while all of them enjoying Baba's company. And then Baba called them, forgave them, said, don't do it again and embrace them and it was all over. <laughs> I remember once I was going to Guru Prasad and uh, uh, when I was leaving Nausari, the town I come from, uh, up, uh, medical rep, we call him medical reps, one who canvasses for his drugs. He is a schizophrenic and uh, he has told me that, uh, uh, he asked me where I was going. I said I was going to see Meher Baba. He had heard about Meher Baba. He says, can I come? I said, Baba's in seclusion. He may not grant you darshan. If you want him, he come. So he said, I'll join you. So he joined me and both of us came to Pune. And uh, this man had not slept a wink for the last seven years. He was, you know, something wrong in his upper story here. So, he had had a lot of treatment for it, even shots and things like that, but nothing worked. And uh, for seven years, this man had not had a wink of sleep. And he said, I'm going to see Baba. So, he came and I was called early morning and he came in with the regular people at nine o'clock. So, when he arrived, I was looking at Baba. Baba suddenly looked at me and says, your friend has come. I said, yes, Baba. And then he sat down there and uh, after the program, morning program finished, I remember Baba, he came up to Baba, embraced Baba, bowed down to him and Baba said, what's the trouble with you? You know, Baba was a doctor also because he advised a number of people uh, what drugs to take. And so he asked this man, well, what's the trouble? He says, Baba, I haven't slept for seven years. Baba says, seven years? Yes, seven years. <laughs> so Baba, you know, Baba did this. E, this is an E, a Q. It's a tablet called Equanil, it's a tranquilizer. So he told Goyer to write out a prescription for him and uh, Equanil tablets. And Baba said, take one every night for 30 days. 
and take my name before you take. He said, okay, Bob. He took the prescription, came out, and when we were going out to Guru Prasad, he tells me, um, Doc, I've taken a number of these tablets and nothing, and these tablets do no good to me. I can never sleep with these. I said, well, all these tablets that you have been prescribed to you have been prescribed by doctors. Here is this Baba giving it to you, so you must take it. So he went straight to the market and bought thirty tablets of equanimity. And uh, he said, uh, well, uh, he was with me the whole day, and that night he went to his hotel and I went to mine, and um, he took one tablet in the night and he fell asleep. And he fell asleep till the next morning, Baba had called him the next morning, and the next morning when the manager of the, of the hotel woke him up, he got up. Till then he was fast asleep. And he comes to t uh, uh, Baba and says, Baba, in seven years this is my first sleep. So Baba was very happy, I was very happy that here at least now there seems to be some cure for this poor chap. But it was not in his uh, destiny to be cured. So he was with Baba the next day and then he went home. He took seven days, for seven days these tablets and then he stopped them. And he's just as it is now, as he was before. He doesn't sleep even now. You know, this is what we call as destiny and fate. You know, the difference between that, uh, you know what the difference is, destiny and fate, I won't uh, give you details, but you know, in his fate it was meant that he must suffer. But Baba wanted to get him out of that and therefore gave him this prescription. But he just refused to take them and therefore he had to suffer his own fate, in short. Now, well, obedience. Baba always stressed on obedience much more than love. And uh, you might read volumes on obedience, you might hear discourses on obedience, but you can never know what obedience really means until you had been with Baba. I remember once at Guru Prasad, I was uh, bending over and I had a zip bag, a small <coughs> zip bag, and um, I had removed something from it and I had closed the zip halfway. And I was bending over and closing the thing. Just then somebody patted on my back and I looked up and it was Baba. And Baba says, come on. So, in the act of straightening up, I finished closing the zip. Baba says, that is disobedience. Obedience would mean, leave it right there and walk away. So, how he taught you obedience? I remember, uh, uh, another very bitter experience on obedience. This was during the 1962 Sarvas. Uh, Baba had given me instructions that while he was sitting on the stage there with, the, with his lovers, I had been instructed not to leave the tent. I said, okay, Baba. He says, for the rest of the day you can do all your medical work, you can do, attend to everyone, but during the time that I am on the stage, don't leave the tent. I said, okay, Baba. I'll keep that in mind. There was just one order Baba gave me for that east-west sahavas and how I repented. You see, on the first day, if you, you were there? You weren't there. Well, for on the first day it was very, very warm and the westerners were sitting there and fanning themselves because it was really frightfully warm that day. And um, uh, in the afternoon, while the session was going on, suddenly one of the Australian boys fell down from his chair and fainted because the heat was too much for him. So, it was a spontaneous thing for me to rush to him because I was very near to Baba standing next to the stage. And uh, so I rushed to him and uh, I picked him up and I saw that he was uh, unconscious. So I thought I'd remove him from there because uh, people had collected around him and it was disturbing the, the Sarvas program. So I told a few volunteers, come on, let's lift him up and take him up to the side room. So we picked him up and took him to the side room of Guru Prasad. And I forgot my order, I had not to leave the tent. Took him to the side room and um, gave him some treatment. He didn't respond, so I thought I'd get my blood pressure machine. So I rushed to my, my medical tent. And while I was halfway there, suddenly that thought came. Baba had told me not to leave the tent. Now what was I going to do? I had already left the tent and I was running towards the, my tent to get the blood pressure machine. So I thought, now what shall I do? Shall I go back and leave the boy to die there? I thought, I may as well go to my tent and inform my friend who was another doctor there to attend to him. So I went there, told this doctor, please attend to this boy. 
and I went back to where Baba was and stood in the tent. I stood there leaning against one of the pillars, I remember, and I felt terribly bitter that day for disobeying Baba. Why did I leave the tent? Baba had given me only just one order not to leave the tent, and that also I had disobeyed. And I was just crying within myself, why did I leave this tent? Why did I leave this tent? While this program, Darshan program was going on, Baba looks at me, he knew everything that was within, going on within. He called me on the stage, he says, what are you thinking of? This was his sign of what are you thinking of? So I said, Baba, I'm very sorry, I left the tent. I shouldn't have left the tent. So Baba says, forget it, go and stand there. I said, okay, Baba. I went and stood there. But this mind, oh God, it was just <laughs> hell. Again, the same thoughts, why did I leave the tent? Why did I leave the tent? I should not have left the tent. You know, it was just terrible. Another five minutes like that, and Baba, come here. So again he called me, he said, what are you thinking of? I said, Baba, the same thing. So Baba says, forget it, go and stand there. So I said, okay, Baba. Went and stood there and this time with double vigor, you know. I thought, I, I, you know, I, I never get headaches, except when something happened. <laughs> and that day I think I must have got a headache. It was just splitting, you know. Why did I leave the stent? I, I thought I should die because I disobeyed Baba. And a third time Baba looked at me and called, at me, called me. I came to the stage, this time he didn't ask me what was wrong. All he did was, he just caught hold of my hand to go. And you know, just that one touch, and this thing became absolute quiet, just tranquil, silence, not a thought of this, this incident. I stood there till five o'clock till the program finished, and then after that I had to do a lot of medical work. And at twelve ten in the night, when I went to bed, I thought of this incident. Till then, not a thought of this even. This is just obedience, how much obedience we need to do. I was there and um, she had a dysentery and she had to run to the toilet very often and Baba said uh, to her, Baba was going out on a trip and Baba wanted to take her with, with him. And um, he said, you got to join us. And she had dysentery and every few minutes she had to run to the toilet and Baba says, this is the time, old blue bus time, you know, when Baba used to go out for must trips in the blue bus. And uh, Baba said, you not got to sit on, uh, sit on the seat. Baba put a small stool for her in the middle of the, of the bus and said, you sit on that. And uh, she obeyed. And uh, Baba said, the first stop will be after three or four hours. The bus will not stop till then. And she said, yes, Baba. And she sat there and listened to this obedience. <laughs> Some things on what is ten. Well, I think I'll be seeing you all again tomorrow. At least I hope to somewhere, sometime, if possible. We can tell you. We can go on telling you these stories one after another. If you read the small book, Compassionate Father, I don't know if it's come to Washington already. There are lots of stories there also, but these are different ones. Uh, I tell you something on love. Some really. Touching ones on love. Okay. Uh, this was at Guru Prasad also. Uh, Baba was giving darshan, and that was the last day of the darshan. You know, in the summer months, every weekend I'd be going there. And uh, this was the last day because after that, Baba was to return back to Mirza. And uh, Five o'clock, the darshan was to finish, and um, at four o'clock we looked at the clock, and we were feeling very sorry that an hour only more, and Baba would be going away, and we'd see him again after a year or so. Maybe he'd call up in between, but more or less every time he came to Purpusa, we'd come there. So we thought for a year we wouldn't be seeing Baba. Exactly at five o'clock, Baba said, "Program over. All of you leave." And nobody left. <laughs> Everybody stood there, you know. They got up, but they didn't want to go because they wanted to see Baba even for the last few minutes before he went into his room. 
So I was one of them also. We all disagreed with Baba. And um, so I was standing there and watching Baba, Baba got up and everybody shouting, Altar, Mir Baba, Ki Jai. And then he slowly walked towards the, you know, in the room where the women stay, from the central hall of Guru Gusa. And he was just near the door. At that time, the whole crowd was, you know, watching Baba on their toes, you know, to see Baba for the last time. And so was I at one corner. And this time I began to cry and I said, I felt in my heart, Oh Baba, when will I see you again? Just then Baba turns around, looks at me and says, You come here tomorrow. You get that? You know, how loving he was. Once, I remember when he had the severe pain in his neck, the vital spondylosis, a very big medical term. It means the regeneration of the spine in the in this neck region. And he had excruciating pain. I remember it was just terrible. And uh, Baba had that collar so that he couldn't move his neck. If he had to turn, he had to turn end block. You know, the whole body had to be turned like that. Every movement of the neck was so painful. And I remember I was at Nausari and Baba was to leave uh, Merzad and come to Pune. And uh, I knew that Baba was to arrive today, on that particular day. So from the morning I was thinking of Baba and I was thinking, Baba will get into the car. And uh, every bump on that road from Merzad to Pune, Baba had to suffer so much because of that pain. Every bump was so painful. And the whole day I was just, you know, thinking on this only, that Baba, must he have reached properly? Must the Mandali have taken great care of him? Must the give him pain? And the whole day was spoiled, you know, thinking of this only. Next morning I get a telegram from Baba saying, I arrived comfortably, how are you? <laughs> uh, Baba had a soft corner for our center, the center at Navsari. And each month he uh, let make air to write a letter to us. And something or other, some news from Baba would definitely come each month. And um, our center was one center. I don't like to post about our center, but um, all the other centers do a lot of Baba work, you know, spreading Baba's messages in the villages and things like that. We also used to do that. But we used to never send reports to Baba. Every other center, every program that they did, they sent a big, huge type report to Baba saying that we did this. We felt that Baba knows everything, there's no need to send him any reports. And therefore we never send reports. And yet, every month Baba write to us. So once it so happened that for three months we had not heard from Baba. And all of us were feeling, well, sort of in the blues, why Baba is not, Baba is to walk now. So every Sunday evening we go for a walk. All the Baba lovers get together and we go to a walk. We go for a walk to the riverside outside the town. And I remember we were on the bridge and uh, one of the Baba lovers says, Bruja, I think the Baba is to now. Because there's no letter since three months. Maybe. Next morning, telegram from Baba. How are my lovers at Nausari? <laughs> Some people, you know, with some people, you see Baba and it clicks. And with fellows like me, it took years. I remember one ca- a fellow in a, in, a, in a place, in a small village, he was a genuine seeker. And uh, he, uh, one day it so happened that a Baba lover came in his village talking about Baba. So he heard this Baba lover talking and uh, as soon as he heard Mayor Baba's name and all that this man had to say, he felt, this is the person I am seeking for. So he went up to that man and asked him about uh, Baba and uh, collected information about Baba. And then he wrote to Adi and uh, Adi sent him uh, Baba's literature. And he read Baba's literature and he really felt that here my search is finished. I don't have to go anywhere now. And then uh, his family also got interested in Baba and they said, let's go to see Baba. He says, if we really love Baba, we don't have to go to see Baba. Baba will come here someday. If our love is really, really sincere, Baba will come to us. And it so happened 
that Baba came to their village to give darshan. And um, it was a joy for that family. For years they had been waiting for Baba. And um, thousands of people collected. And uh, when uh, Baba came and sat there and all of these fellows came to see Baba, when this family, particular family came to Baba, and this man in particular when he came to see Baba, he stood in front of Baba, bowed down, and, uh, and Baba knew his inside, the sincerity there. So, Baba says, ask for anything you want. I hope he had asked me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, he said, um, ask for anything. He says, Baba, I don't want anything. I just want you now. And that's all I want. So, Baba says, um, are you willing to sacrifice anything for that? He says, yes. The Baba says, what? He says, this. Willing to cut my throat for you. Baba just embraced him. And this man, a real gem of man. Baba always say, this is a sign for a gem. Gem means, you know, a gem is a gem in a, in a ring. And any real good lover, he point out and tell me, you know, <laughs> here is a gem. And many times I tell you, we lived with Baba, played with Baba, and some people who had never seen Baba came for the first time to Baba, and Baba pointed out, he's a gem. So, there are many lovers who never met Baba, or probably met him once only, but they were real good gems. And this fellow was a gem. And uh, I remember a few days before Baba passed away, Baba was in strict seclusion at that time, but he sent this man a letter. And the letter said that your love for me touches my divine love. You are blessed. He's still there, this man. You know Siduji, Siduji, the man who takes care of Muhammad. This man came to Baba in 1924. For the first time he came to see Baba. He was very poor. He came to Baba and um, and he said, Baba, I want to join you. Just first glance at Baba and he said, I want to join you. So, Baba said, you come back after a year. So, he came back after a year. This was in 1925 when Baba was talking. And Baba says, uh, will you stay with me? He says, yes, Baba. Will you do everything that I say? Yes, Baba. Everything? Yes, Baba. Will you clean the toilets? He says, yes, Baba. Will you attend to the patients in the hospital, Baba, at a small hospital there? He says, yes, Baba, I'll do anything you say, but keep me with you, that's all. You know, that past connections with Baba were there, and he joined Baba. And Baba made him do anything from cleaning toilets to attend to the patients, to becoming a barber, and to do anything, and he do it with love, and he really loved Baba. One day this Siddhuji poor fellow fell ill. And he became unconscious for thirteen days and thirteen nights, completely unconscious. And in those days the treatment for unconsciousness was, I really wonder how, what it was at that time. Anyway, after thirteen days this fellow uh, recovered. And uh, Baba was at his bedside on the thirteenth day. And this fellow just opened his eyes after thirteen days of being unconscious. And the first thing to see was Baba's smiling face. And he got up from the bed and embraced Baba and says, Baba, it's because of you I have lived, I wouldn't have come back again. I have nothing to give to you. What can I give you? Baba just embraced him and said, Your love. Um, how about these stories never finish? <laughs> I'll tell you about Mera before we pass. How Mera really loved Baba. And um, that Baba always used to say that Mera loves me as I should be loved. And I used to really wonder how Mera loved Baba and why shouldn't we love Baba in the same way? What is the difference between her love and my love? And here <laughs> Baba showed us during the 62 Sava. You know, anything that you wanted, Baba would give you an explanation for it. And uh, this was what he showed me. I remember, 62 Savas Baba had the same uh, pain in the neck, and it was terrible. And I know when he came on the stage and sat down with 5,000 of his lovers in front of him, 
he'd be so happy and smiling and jovial and everybody would embrace people and he'd do anything for the lovers because, as Baba said, he was a slave of his lovers. But as soon as he came inside, Prophet Gaur and myself would see Baba and the pain. Because for three hours moving about like this, you know, and touching time, how people come and embrace Baba and press him and do anything that they want to do. They call out a love they do it. They don't know that they are causing trouble to Baba. So, during this time, I remember, I was standing just beyond the stage and five thousand pairs of eyes watching Baba and all of a sudden, Adi comes on the stage and the Baba is sitting there, he comes behind Baba's right shoulder and tells Baba something in his ear. Well, naturally, when somebody talks from behind, Baba had to turn a wee bit in order to see who it was. And Adi went on talking and Baba had his head turned a wee bit. Five thousand of us watching Baba and Mera was behind Baba, behind curtains. You know, they never used to come out in public at that time. Behind curtains, from a small chink in the curtain, she was watching Baba and immediately she sent a message to Adi saying, Adi, don't stand at the back, stand in front of Baba and talk. The laugh that she had, you know, because Baba had to turn his head and that caused him more pain. So she, looking from the back, she told Adi, go in front and talk. I mean, we all love Baba, but how much love she had for Baba, that she could appreciate that Baba was suffering more by this fellow talking in the back, and therefore she asked him to go in front. This is one thing that Baba showed me. And another time, I remember during the same Savas, uh, one day, uh, she sent a cushion from inside, uh, with uh, orders to Eric, that uh, remove the cushion behind Baba's back and put this one in. So, uh, when the cushion arrived, Baba just, I mean, Eric just told Baba, Baba, please bend the little in front, and Eric removed that cushion and put this other cushion down behind Baba's back. And that cushion which he removed was completely full of sweat. How much love, you know, when you have that degree of love, everything for the beloved, you, you, don't, you never think of your own self. You just want to think of your beloved, so much of your beloved, that every thought of yourself has disappeared completely. And really, Mera loved Baba.